So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Luke Roy from Auburn University, and um, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, low salinity water and, and, and the effects of salinity and ionic balances in the water. This is something that some people are considering. Uh, one of our projects, I don't know if you caught that yesterday on the tour, but one of our projects is collaborating with him and his group at Auburn and a uh, group at Purdue as well, looking at uh, formulating some low-cost salt mixtures to help save on recurring costs, especially for indoor strip farmers. And so that's a line of research that we're looking at together. And uh, Luke is really the expert on that, so I'm going to let him talk about it. All right. Thanks, Drew. Uh I'm glad to have this opportunity to come and, and spend some time with you guys up here in Kentucky. Uh, we're going to be uh, switching gears a little bit from, from, from some of the other talks, because uh, down there in, in Alabama, uh, we, we do pond production uh, in open ponds, um, but we, we have, have had some issues with, with ionic balance that, that we've had to help our farmers with, and I think some of this information uh, could potentially be valuable to, to bioflock producers down the road. So I'm going to talk about shrimp culture in inland uh, low salinity waters uh, in West Alabama and the water remedi remediation strategies uh, that we've used to improve ionic balance uh, and maximize production under those uh, circumstances. Um, I don't have too many introductory slides because uh, it's kind of been covered. Uh, I do have uh, here the you know, U.S. shrimp production. Most of this is from ponds. This is from Granville Trees from 2015. I couldn't find the Florida numbers for uh, 2016 or 2017, so I just put the 2015 numbers. But th this hasn't changed too much. Um, uh, in mainland uh, U.S. shrimp production in 2015 was right under 3.8 million pounds on close to 1,300 uh, acres, water acres uh, of production. This doesn't include, uh, I see a little side note down here, uh, the bioflop, any of the bioflop facilities. Um, the numbers in Texas and Alabama are, are strictly pond production, uh, but uh, I believe Granville did say some of the numbers from Florida did include a couple of greenhouse uh, systems. So, you know, we're, we're a fairly small player in, uh, in, the, in the shrimp world, and that's kind of already been touched upon by uh, in other talks. Um, but we do have a, a group of, of farmers uh, in the U.S. who are taking advantage of uh, low salinity uh, artesian well water, uh, the water that's been under, under the ground. In Alabama, 80,000 years ago, um, the Gulf of Mexico covered uh, about half of the state, and actually, the the the, re the counties around where I live uh, have some of the best uh, aquatic dinosaur uh, fossils uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and th basically, we're using the remnants of from that um, that event uh, that that's trapped underground to grow shrimp. And there's other states that have access to, to some low salinity uh, water, but since 1999, uh, this water source has been used by a handful of shrimp farmers in Alabama to, to culture the Pacific white shrimp. And uh, it's been touched upon earlier, but the Pacific white shrimp is, is, is able to tolerate extremely low uh, salinities. Uh, the water that we have in West Alabama uh, ranges from about two parts per thousand or grams per liter to 11 uh, parts per thousand. Um, so this is semi-intensive uh, production. And um, in 2018, uh, we had three producers uh, stock farms on uh, 125 uh, water acres. In 2017, we had uh, five producers, uh, but one of them uh, is, is uh, in his 90s now, and he's decided to, to retire. And the other one, with the PL uh, issue that we were having, supply issue, he decided not to stock. Um, our cost of production are, are way different than what you guys experience here. Um, we, uh, fixed and variable costs, we can pr uh, produce shrimp for less than $3 a pound. The problem is we can't sell them <laughs> for near as much as what you guys can over here. Um, our, uh, I took this, this picture on September 6th when I was out on one of the shrimp farms just uh, you know, 10 days ago. Uh, one of the farmers was harvesting. He was selling 11 count shrimp for uh, 450 a pound, uh, fresh to the public. Um, and depending on size, our, you know, it's anywhere from 450 to 575 a pound. Typically, our farmers are producing a 10 to 20 uh, count shrimp. Uh, most uh, two of the farmers are selling fresh to the uh, public, where they kind of announce it in the newspapers and online. 
uh, folks drive up to the farm. Uh, the other one uh, does that also, but he's also selling the grocery stores uh, like Whole Foods and also a grocery chain in Canada. I can't remember the, the name of it at, at, at the moment. Um, this is basically, a, just to give you kind of a visual, this is an Alabama shrimp and catfish farm. This is just, uh, these are three, uh, three big catfish far, uh, ponds, and then he has about uh, 10 smaller um, shrimp ponds. So a lot of the guys that, are, that got into shrimp in Alabama, uh, they were already producing catfish and were already kind of in aquaculture and just kind of decided to try um, some, some other alternatives. Um, these are some of the advantages of pond production. Um, in, in our area, we have uh, inland saline water that's not suitable for traditional agriculture purposes. We have ponds, we have technical expertise for folks that are already in aquaculture, and we have quite a bit of infrastructure to support pond aquaculture in that region. Um, we also have the natural productivity of the ponds, uh, which, which helps with our FCRs, keeping them low. Um, we have a lot less diseases because we're uh, 150 to 200 miles north of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we're, we're not exposed to, to seawater, uh, you know, only when we bring the, the PLs in. We have a local uh, market and we have a, a lower cost of production. Um, the disadvantages uh, are um, we, we have issues when we drain, we drain harvest these ponds, so we do have to deal with salinization. Um, and we, we have stra used strategies basically to, to, to discharge as, as, as little as possible. A lot of these farms are built on hills, so we might have to discharge the first pond, but then we can drain the second pond into the first and, and not drain as much of the salty water. We have major issues with toxic algae, um, both blue-greens and, and the golden variety. Uh, we can have issues with off-flavor uh, as well. Um, ionic composition of the water, which is kind of the focus of the, of the talk. I'll get, in, it, get into that a little bit more, but it's very, very expensive for us to fertilize uh, our ponds with potassium and, and magnesium, which are the ions that, that are deficient and that we have to deal with. Also have issues with, with predators like water, water birds, uh, snakes, turtles, sometimes alligator, an alligator or two uh, that'll get in a pond. Uh, so that, that basically cuts the, the bottom line of the producers as well. Uh, we're long distances from the hatcheries, so our farmers have to drive uh, in trucks to, to pick them up because uh, we're buying large quantities. But you know, probably the biggest disadvantage uh, is that all of our product is harvested in, in four to six weeks uh, in September and October of the year. Uh, so that, that's a very different situation. That's an advantage that you guys have uh, as Bioflock or Clearwater producers, whatever it may be, is, is providing that year-round product. and. Uh, not being able to 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 do that kind of hurts you know, you know uh, the the amount of, that we can request uh, for our product in the market, so we have to either immediately sell it or have it processed and frozen. So just to give you just a very quick breakdown of the kind of the culture paradigm, in March and April we prepare greenhouses and fertilize ponds, get our PLs in May and June, um, and acclimate them. Uh, grow outs from June uh, through October. Um, and then typically we harvest this time of year in, in September and October before cold temperatures uh, arrive. Um, you know, if we don't get our, our shrimp out of the water by October 15th, we can run the risk of them uh, getting too cold and, and dying on us. And then in the winter months, typically uh, we repair equipment. So just to kind of give you an issue, uh, just introduce you into the, the, this whole uh, concept of, of why we're, we're having to uh, deal with ionic balance problems. Um, in 1999, that, that's Dickie Odom. He's the first um, farmer to, to try this in Alabama. Um, he did, just decided, he knew he had salt water. Um, his farm that he grew catfish, ponds that he grew catfish in, had 4.5 PPT. Uh, so he said, well, let's see if we can grow Vanami, because he knew that they tolerated low salinity. And, and he was successful, uh, but his survival was less than 30 percent in um, in that first season, but he did have large shrimp after that first year. So over over several years, um, you know, the first couple years, um, couldn't really figure out why um, the shrimp weren't weren't doing that well. And, and Auburn University got involved, uh, and also there was work being done in in Clemson, Arizona, other states that were also doing low salinity water. Um, and we found uh, basically that the the waters were deficient in, in potassium and magnesium. 
And once we found, uh, found that out through, through research and, um, on, on farms and in the lab, we started to add that to the water and it increased our, our uh, survivals. Uh, and these, these are in uh, uh, pounds to the, the acre, uh, the production numbers. Um, this is a survival uh, over here. Um, so it increased our survival and increased our production. Um, just currently, we're producing about 2,000 to 5,000 pounds to the acre. Survival uh, is still pretty variable, um, uh, but in acre water, you know, we, we can produce up, you know, upwards of 5,000 pounds. And there's been two strategies that have been employed to, to counteract this issue. Uh, the first one, which is kind of the focus of this talk, was modification of the pond water or ionic balance. Um, we, we tried a lot, of, a lot of work with feeds uh, initially, the first five or six years, and, and we did see some responses in the lab, but when we, when we worked uh, to, with the farmers to try and out feeds like in, with the pond water that they had, if we didn't correct the water, it really didn't matter what we were putting in the feed, uh, they, the, the shrimp wouldn't perform as well. So um, at least the you know, farmers in Alabama typically amend their water. But in other, other regions of the world, they are actually using uh, the strategy of feed. And, and in some cases, it's been successful as well. Um, so initially, what we did uh, was a lot of bioassays. You know, um, I, I'm an extension specialist with Auburn. So my job, uh, I'm off campus about three hours from, from the university. And, and we do a lot of uh, applied research and demonstration on farms. I work directly with producers to try to help solve a lot of their problems. And, what we ended up doing in this case was getting a lot of pond water from a lot of different farms uh, in different ponds and uh, running bioassays with them to, to look at correlations between ionic profiles in the water and, and the survival of the, the PLs. And, and this just kind of shows you a couple of different farms. Um, this reference uh, here uh, in yellow is four parts per thousand um, reconstituted seawater, so that was kind of our reference. And you can see there's you know, pretty large variations in the amount of uh, magnesium uh, and, and potassium uh, you know, at these farms. And th that was causing a problem because the, the levels really weren't uh, at, the, at the, the, the concentrations and ratios that they needed to be for, for successful production. Um, so in summary, after a, a year or two of work, um, we, what was revealed was that, that aqueous potassium, magnesium, were the major problem in the, in the shrimp farms. And uh, post larvae, uh, another thing that we found in our circumstance is they seemed to survive stocking uh, into ponds uh, if we waited until after they were PL15. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, that, a lot of that has to do with uh, what uh, Eduardo was talking about with the gill development. Um, you know, initially farmers were stocking, you know, a PL8 or 10 and, and uh, we were having some issues with, with, with survival. Um, and through a series of studies with, with, with Dr. Davis and Dr. Boyd uh, at Auburn uh, and, and myself, we, it was determined that major cations are needed to correct ionic imbalances in the pond. Uh, and, and that's just, just something that we have to do. So uh, I'm going to talk about sodium to, to potassium ratios. And, and I get a lot of calls about this, and a, a, a lot of folks don't like to talk about it because it's, it, it's a little bit of chemistry, but um, we, we have at Auburn, uh, folks send us their water samples kind of from all over the world, um, and we kind of look at it and kind of give recommendations as far as what they might need to supplement their ponds with to make it viable for, uh, for culture of shrimp uh, in low salinity in environments. Um, but, so it's important to understand at low salinity what sodium to potassium ratios are. And the ionic ratio of sodium to potassium in the water is more important uh, than the pond water uh, salinity. A lot of folks think, oh, I got 10, 10 part per thousand salinity in my ponds. Uh, I, can, I can grow shrimp you know, better than somebody with two. Well, you can grow shrimp you know, potentially, but you're gonna have to put prop potentially five times more potassium, five times more magnesium to get the ratio up to correct to the right amount if you have a higher salinity. So in, in that case, it's actually a disadvantage. But potassium is required uh, for a proper function of the sodium to potassium ATPase, which is needed for osmotic anionic uh, regulation in, in, uh, in crustaceans. 
And you know, if you don't have the proper ratio, you can end up with osmotic stress, and that can subsequently affect you know, growth and survival in, in shrimp. And in culture water with, with, with pretty low ratio, uh, with, with low ionic ratios, um, they can be lethargic, uh, swim erratically, and they have a lot of issues with, you know, when they, they molt. And I, I always kind of put this caveat on here, um, be extremely careful if you try to make your own salt water. I've had a lot of calls from, from, from bioflock producers that have tried to save money by making their own salt as opposed to, to using kind of the reconstituted seawater products. And, and, and as uh, Dr. Ray said, we're working on trying to come up with kind of a different options for that to save money, but um, really it, it's probably best to use the reconstituted seawater products unless you really know what you're doing in terms of ra ratios. So just here's a little bit of chemistry. You'll hear about ionic and molar ratios. Everyone hears the word molar, and, and I, I think they remember you know, chemistry from, from high school and, and, and get scared about the calculation, but it's not that hard to do. But there's two ways to calculate it. There's two ways that you see it in the literature, so I, I put them both up here. To calculate the, the ionic ratio, you basically take the, the level in seawater uh, of, of sodium and potassium and, and basically just divide uh, the potassium into the sodium, and what you get is 27.6, or about 28 to 1 is the ideal ratio in, in seawater. Uh, to, to calculate the molar ratio, it's, you know, it's just an extra step. You have to take the atomic weights from the, from the periodic table and uh, add those in there, uh, but the, op the optimal molar ratio is, is 47 to 1. So I have one producer who, when I send him data, he makes me convert everything to moles, molar ratios, and the other two producers I work with want it in ionic ratio. So it just kind of depends on what, what folks are, are comfortable um, uh, using. Um, this is just some work um, that we did uh, or back at Auburn about 10 years ago where we took different sodium to potassium ratios, and this is at four parts per thousand low salinity water and did some studies. And we found that, you know, at ratios close to 120, um, you know, survival was, was impeded in, in the shrimp. Um, and, you know, once you ended up, you know, with around, you know, 68 or 70, you were, you were okay. Um, but we, we typically recommend, you know, that, that farmers try to, to adjust the levels of potassium to, to what it is in seawater uh, for, for the production cycle. Um, magnesium and calcium ratios are, are kind of calculated in the, the same way. They're also in, important. Um, in Alabama, we typically don't have to worry as much about uh, magnesium to calcium ratios. Um, um, the ratio in seawater is 3.4 to 1 if you do the math. But a lot of work that was done by, by Dr. Boyd and, uh, and others at Auburn showed that for our West Alabama waters, as long as you had tw your magnesium above 20 milligrams per liter, you were okay. So the, the ratio is, is not that, that we have in our West Alabama waters, not really that close to what it should be. Um, but since we're, we weren't seeing any you know, bad effects, we didn't want to tell the farmers to put tons and tons of this of of magnesium in their water because it's an additional expense. So we basically kind of calculated what the minimum level was um, in order to do that. But that doesn't hold true in other areas. A, a lot of studies have shown that, um, you know, you often need higher levels of magnesium. We have really high hardness uh, in, in our waters in, in, in West Alabama, but the kind of the take home is optimal levels depend on the salinity uh, and also the, the calcium concentration in the water. Um, this was some, some stuff that we did also uh, a, a while back with Auburn, uh, where, uh, you know, looking at uh, magnesium levels in the water, uh, a 10 part per million treatment. This was also done at 4 PPT, low salinity, and some experiments that we did uh, on campus, uh, you know, showed reduced survival. But as long as you hit that 20 milligrams per liter mark, it was, you know, pretty much comparable across the board, and there weren't, there weren't any differences. So, you know, I've been talking about potassium, magnesium. Uh, uh, this is how we kind of add it uh, to the ponds. Uh, we have to conduct an ion profile analysis for each pond. So every pond on the farm, uh, the, the farmer will get, uh, give us samples and we'll, uh, we'll run them a form to, to determine uh, how much of these fertilizers we need to eat uh, to add. Typically, we do this three times per year. Uh, prior to fertilizer application, immediately after to make sure that we put enough, and then usually once uh, during the production cycle, 
uh, and in some cases more, um, because what happens is, um, I'm not really gonna get into this in, in this presentation, but the soils that we have out there in West Alabama, the pond soils, are constantly pulling the potassium and the magnesium out of the water. And, and over the course of the production cycle, uh, they'll, they'll reduce it, you know, by, by 20, 30 milligrams per liter in the water. So, and with rain, if you get a lot of rain too, that, that affects it. So uh, we can't, the, the producers have to stay on top of this and it's just some, something extra that they have to do uh, in their circumstance. Um, this is, you know, at, at the Alabama Fish Farm and Center, we, we kind of provide that, that service for our producers. Um, they'll, they'll give us the water samples um, and we'll determine basically the ion profile for the major ion, the four ions that, 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 that are of concern for us. Uh, we test sodium potassium using a, a flame photometer and then calcium magnesium. Uh, we basically use some titrations uh, um, that, that, are, that were suggested by, by Dr. Boyd. Um, this is kind of the, a real uh, helpful slide. This is a, from an article that Dr. Boyd wrote in Global Aquaculture Advocate. Actually came out this year. Um, but this, this is um, basically showing you what the concentration of these ions is in normal seawater. And so what he came up with was a factor. So you can multiply this factor here on the right-hand side of this table by the salinity to give the seawater equivalent concentration of cations you know, for your systems. Um, so uh, that's just a useful uh, table to have. So uh, we, we run a lot of water samples for, for, for our producers um, and you know, we basically do the calculations and then email them uh, or, or call them on the phone and tell them how much to add. We do have to add a lot of, a lot of these by the, the truckload. It ends up, we're dealing with, with, with lots of water because we're dealing with ponds. Um, so we have to basically order uh, truckloads of this stuff and then put amounts and different amounts in the ponds. It might be 2,000 pounds in one pond, 3,000 pounds in another, um, but it kind of varies depending on, on the situation. So at, at present, shrimp farmers have been maintaining their, their ratios as close to 28 to 1 um, as possible, and their magnesiums at, at 20 milligrams per liter or higher. Uh, and in doing this, uh, farmers have been successful raising their shrimp down to salinities as low as, as one PPT in, in West Alabama. Um, uh, looking here at, at artificial seawater, we do have kind of short indoor phase uh, where we acclimate um, our shrimp before we put them in ponds. Uh, and we do use uh, typically reconstituted seawater products to do this acclimation, which lasts usually about two weeks. In some cases, farmers have begun trying to use um, uh, their own salt mixtures to, to save money, uh, and, and that's kind of resulted in some of the, the work that, that Drew was talking about. Um, at stocking, you know, we fertilize these uh, uh, ponds two to three weeks in advance to ensure we have the, the correct levels of potassium, magnesium. Um, and then um, I'll just add, the, add this in here. Typically, we hold them for seven to 14 days and stock a PL 17 to 22 shrimp. Um, and during the acclimation, we reduce uh, the salinity from 15 PPT to the desired target salinity of, of, of the ponds. Uh, and typically, we, we try to reach that target salinity about 48 hours before we, we stock. Um, and another thing that we've noticed is, is best results have been achieved when we wait till the water temperature's 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So what Eduardo was saying about uh, holding them as long as possible, that definitely uh, holds true. In our case, uh, we stock an older uh, post larvae, we tend to have better survival. Um, our, just real quickly, our stocking rates, typically 100,000 to 150,000 shrimp per acre. Our largest farmer stocks about 10 million shrimp uh, in his uh, farm, and we have pond sizes of, of about four acres on average. And we'll, we'll acclimate them you know, from the greenhouse. To, uh, we'll put them in these tubs and take them down to the pond, and then take time to, to to adequately acclimate them down to, to the actual temperature uh, and ionic composition of the, the pond that we uh, stock them in. Um, this is just uh, you know, some, a slide on what we do in terms of grow out, which is a little diff different strategy, you know, since we're using ponds. We feed a 32 to 35% protein feed twice a day, um, and production runs from, from May through October. Um, and we drain harvest these ponds and either you know, sell them fresh or, or freeze them and then uh, try to sell them uh, wholesale. 
Um, funding from, from USDA uh, was, was recently secured, as, as Drew said, uh, to look at artificial salts at, at low salinity and um, uh, in biofloc systems uh, with the goal of developing artificial low salinity uh, salt mixture that is more economical for farmers since uh, you biofloc producers are, are typically you know, using a higher salinity uh, in your systems. A salt's definitely an, an expense. Um, just uh, real quickly, I'm going to show you some, some preliminary data that our gra grad student sent, sent me right before I came here where we did some trials at, at Auburn looking at, at some of these low-cost salts. And uh, in, this, in this trial, we, we were looking at uh, 50, we had water that was 15 parts per thousand or grams per liter. And we add, added uh, uh, our own kind of mixture, lower-cost mixture to, to the water. Uh, at different levels to, to make the equivalent concentration of, uh, of the ions uh, that balance at, at 15 parts uh, per thousand salinity. Um, in this trial, we used uh, point, about 0.2 gram shrimp, uh, 20 shrimp per tank and 150 liter uh, plastic tanks. And what we did was we replaced uh, crystal sea salt incrementally with 2.5 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent of our low-cost salt uh, uh, mixture at four replicates uh, per treatment for, for 42 days. And this is just uh, um, uh, some results from that, that trial. We didn't find any significant difference in survival between the different ion solutions, which is good. This is uh, um, something that uh, I didn't, we didn't expect to see, which is Actually, some of the, the low-cost salt mixtures actually outperformed our uh, controls, which were reconstituted seawater. So this is just kind of some, some preliminary information. We're going to run some more trials. But uh, the good thing is that even, even using this low-cost salt mixture at 100 you percent, know, we had good survivals and, and good growth. So it's a good start. So, so in conclusion, uh, semi-intensive shrimp production uh, it does have excellent potential in the United States, um, but we haven't expanded. We've kind of been going the other direction for a, a number of reasons that, that have kind of been touched on uh, already, particularly the, the lack of reliable uh, PL supply. That's really kept a lot, of, a lot of farmers that have come to me wanting to get into it. When I explain to them the PL supply, they, they run out the door as quickly as possible. They just they don't like the, the, the risk of, of putting so much money in and potentially having supply issues. Um, but proper balance of ions in, in the pond water for our producers is essential, uh, and, and it is also essential, you know, in biofloc and, and clear water systems as well. Um, just a few, a few tips that, that may benefit some of you guys that use biofloc. With acclimation, uh, make sure to balance ion profiles of culture water prior to receiving PLs. Uh, I've gotten calls from, from biofloc producers that they've, they've received their PLs and, and they've actually used sodium chloride or, you know, basically, you know, rock salt to, to make their, their holding solution. And, and you, you need, you know, I know most folks aren't going to make those types of mistakes, but we're kind of at a point where um, there's a lot of folks that are getting into this and uh, in, in extension uh, and, and at the university, uh, we're still trying to figure out how the best way to communicate what, what some of these techniques and, and approaches are. And, and I think for the most part, we do a good job. But um, if, if you have a doubt about uh, acclimation, you know, feel free to call, uh, you know, e either myself or, or, or Drew Ray. We, you know, we could help you out uh, in, in any way that we can. Um, and I would encourage the use of, of reconstituted seawater until we come up with, with a, a viable alternative. And, and I think we're, we're close to that uh, with, with some of the research that we're doing at Kentucky State and, and Auburn and, and, and a few other places. Um, so take extreme care to acclimate your shipments of shrimp to your Facilities culture water both both the temperature and the, and the salinity um, Don't rush it. You know when you're acclimating uh, make sure you you, you go slowly uh, and you'll your, your shrimp will, will thank you uh, later uh, Typically we wait seven to 14 days prior to stocking our, our production ponds um, And that's I think a good strategy uh, because as was touched upon earlier a lot of the mortality that will be associated with transport will kind of be over after about five days so uh, we typically wait, you know, seven to 14 days prior to stocking our ponds. That might be uh, a good strategy for you, for you guys that are doing bioflock as well, just so that you know what, what's going in your system. Um, 
I'll add uh, just real briefly, for wh whatever reason, uh, if we wait to our, our shrimp or PL15, they, they just do better when we stock them in ponds. I'm not sure how that translates to um, biofloc producers or not, but I thought I'd just, I'd just put it out there um, just in case. And remember to always reduce uh, salinity uh, slowly. Um, just a final wor word of advice um, to, to you guys that are you know, you know, getting started. Um, the, the Alabama Inland Shrimp Producers Association is a very small organization. Uh, like I said, right now we only have three producers uh, that are currently producing. We have about 20 members in that association that are members either of the university or uh, farms. Uh, and we've been very successful uh, you know, in, in, in kind of communicating with each other, helping each other out with, with issues that arise. Uh, all the farmers that, that you know, are very open about what they do and, and, and sharing information. They've even kind of banded together and secured funding as an association for, for research and development through, through USDA. You know, sometimes you know, a lot of the grants go to universities, but in, in, in the case of, of the Alabama Inland Shrimp Producers Association, they actually secured a grant that went to them directly. And then we then worked with them uh, on, on that particular problem. But um, I'm not sure how you guys as, as biofloc producers are organized within the state or, or, or larger collectively in the, in the regions, but organization at some point as you guys grow might be something that, that you, you might want to think about. Um, our farmers are, are involved uh, politically um, with, with Farm Bureau, and, and, and through that, they've been able to secure funding uh, through the state also, not, not just federal, to, to help us out with different issues. And so I think that's kind of important um, uh, take home uh, from this as well. And also, you know, keep your extension uh, and, and, and research counterparts at the university, uh, uh, keep them busy. Uh, with your problems. That's, that's what our job is, is, is to help you guys out. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, you know, just a few folks uh, that, that helped out with information for this presentation, also uh, funding from, from USDA NEFA. That's all I have.